Over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to speak about, I suppose, my life and how struggles have had an impact on my life. So, I suppose struggle is something that's somewhat taboo still. People don't like to speak about it. They like to come across as extremely macho and put on this persona. But the reality is when everybody gets home and closes that bedroom door, we all have things to deal with. So for myself, my life changed considerably back in 20, it was actually the 28th of December 2012. So coming up to about four years ago. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but I finally understood that struggles are necessary in order to become a, a success, not to everyone else, but in your own mind and in your life. So back in December 2012, a freak accident. I, um, I was out enjoying myself too much in Cork. I stood in a bottle and ended up breaking my foot. I wish it was a much better story, but that's the reality. Um, so I broke my foot. Happens. I've, I've dealt with injuries in sport for a long time. A week later, um, I, I didn't let the crutches hold me back, but for some reason my other foot went. So as somebody who's in, who is active and uh, a PE teacher at the time uh, and an Irish teacher, um, come on, in, but I didn't know my life was going to change straight away. Within the space of a week to 10 days, I had gone from being extremely active to somebody who had no, had to sit in a wheelchair, had to move their bedroom downstairs in their parents' house and just basically deal with something that was alien to me previously. So that took a lot to deal with and you know those people who stand there and say they don't get depressed are in my eyes liars because it happens to everyone. It's how you deal with it that really you know, determines how well you will do or how you'll push forward. I'd like to lie and say that I didn't get depressed but that isn't true either. Um, I got very, very sad and very down. Luckily I had some good people around me but they can only get you so far. So for the next probably, I suppose, nine months, but it was actually reality was probably a year and two months, I suffered a series of injuries and a succession of those breaks. And I, and I actually was in the wheelchair for about three or four months, which had meant to be about three or four weeks. So as a PE teacher, as a soccer player, as somebody who was really, really active, to get that taken away from me because of a, a dodgy dance move was something I had to deal with straight away. Um, luckily, I, I, I started to think to myself, um, am I going to waste this? Am I going to look at this as a reason to get fat, to not shave, and just feel really, really down about myself? Or am I going to do something about it? So luckily, some, for some reason, which I can't really put my finger on, I decided that I was going to change. I was not going to allow myself to, to get down because of this. So simple thing like I'm going to make sure that I shower twice a day, every single day, even though I'm not going to leave the house. Little things like that, little challenges. And my struggle was getting up the stairs because we only have a toilet uh, upstairs in my house. Got through that and I said, look, I'm capable of doing more. So instead of letting the days pass, um, I decided to set myself a roster. And I was always interested in writing, language, uh, linguistics. It's always my strongest um, area in school. So I decided to teach myself how to build a website, and that website was called sportiseverything.com. And Sport is Everything was an aggregator for bloggers and people who wanted to write about sports. They could come into this site and write about sports. So I worked on that 9 to 5, taught myself how to build a website, got some traction, and uh, just out of that, just kept going, and it started to grow. And then I heard of the Ignite program. And the Ignite program is a business innovation program in UCC. What does that mean? Basically, you have an idea, we'll give you an opportunity to grow your idea. If it works, congratulations. If it doesn't, at least you tried and you learned something. So the person who was, who was running the program was a guy called Eamon Curtin. And unbeknownst to me, there was someone else called Ross O'Dwyer who had a similar idea to me. And Eamon was also getting him on Ignite and said to him, look, you know, there's somebody here that you need to meet. He's similar. There might be some synergy. And then he said the exact same to me on the other side. So within two weeks, we soon realized that we had the same idea, and we decided, were we going to go in opposite corners and possibly hide each other's homework and you know, waste time, energy, money, or are we going to see this as an opportunity to come together and set up something that could really, really make a difference? And in November 2013, uh, we launched PunditArena.com. And Pundit Arena, for those who don't know, is just a sports media platform that allows fans to write about sports. So my struggles of breaking my foot 
being in a wheelchair to then develop into getting into this business innovation program, I realized that it was necessary for me. It was a formative process. That time in the wheelchair molded me to be ready for what lay ahead in terms of business. So we started Funded Arena, and thankfully we had some success, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it continued to grow. And for me, I look back on those breaks as something that was incredibly necessary. So for anybody that's struggling out there, when you are going through that period, if you can get into the mindset that this is an opportunity for me, this is a challenge, this is, this is a formative process, this is going to turn me into the person that I need to be, then it's amazing the results will come. So that was challenge number one. Grew the business, um, probably focused on users too much and not, not enough on the revenue, which a lot of uh, young upstarts tend, tend to do. So we grew the business and we started to add more and more users. We were in a couple of million users. And, but the reality was we just did not have the money to keep the business going. And, you know, we, we, we had people working for us in the office at the time, and they were working for free. We were, working, we were winning awards. We had won a number of awards. But the reality was we had no money. Uh, the emperor had no clothes. I remember sitting in News Talk Studios doing an interview with them, uh, which seems to be a recurring theme. I'll talk about that later. But talking about how we were going to take over the world, how we were going to expand, we were going to scale. We were brilliant at building a business. Whereas the reality was when that studio turned off and I walked out the door, you know, you're straight away into the mindset that I have two, three days to make payroll or else the people in my office aren't going to be paid and our business will probably die. And that's also a recurring theme for businesses and it's one that's not really spoken about cash flow. And for us, cash flow has been an issue in, our early, in, our, in the early period, one that we didn't really speak about. So we were getting all, this, all these plaudits. We had to keep the show on the road. And the struggle for me was, as one of the, the leaders in the business with Ross, you know, we need to maintain this smile, this happy persona, and not allow it to be detrimental to the people that have put their faith in us. So we decided we'd go out and raise some investment. Um, two guys came to us, bearing in mind Ross and I didn't have a penny to our name. Savings are just not part of uh, a startup's dictionary, so our savings were gone. We were carpooling up to Dublin, sharing a hotel room, with a, a, a double bed in the Russell Court Hotel, and for those who don't know, that's part of the Dicey's. So that probably delayed us a bit, but there, we, we were working so hard, and we had people working for us for free back in Cork, but the business was nearing extinction. Um, there was just no money coming, and it looked like there was no way that we were going to get out of this hole. We were incurring costs. We owed money. We went to Microfinance Ireland. We started looking at all the different ways that we could get ourselves out of this hole and just buy us some time. So when I started up the business, I thought, this is going to be brilliant. You get in the newspapers. People will know Pundit Arena. You'll be on a train in, in, in London, and somebody's reading your... Somebody's actually using Pundit Arena in front of you, and you're thinking, this is brilliant. But behind it all, we actually had nothing. And it was, for me, that was struggle number two, trying to put on this brave face and say that, you know, we are taking over the world. And the reality is, we can't keep the lights on. And it looked like there was no way we would possibly get ourselves out of this hole. Until I reached out to a Cork businessman, and I said to him, look, you've dealt with not being able to pay your wages to your staff, to your team members, to the people who trusted in you. What did you do when you had to go to them on that Friday and tell them they weren't going to get wages? So he spoke to me, he gave me some advice, and he said, how much do you owe? And I said, oh, it's relatively small, it's about nine grand. This was back in the early days. And he said, look, I'll meet you for a coffee next week, but that nine grand will be in your account tomorrow. And he said, don't ever ever tell anybody who I am, but you pay me back when you have it. And for us to see someone put that much faith in, in us made me realize that Pundit Arena had become more than just Ross and Richard. It was about the people who were actually slaving away inside the office working for us. So it was inevitable that this struggle had taught us to ensure that we needed to keep smiling and keep fighting and just keep those lights on and just ensure that the wheel keeps on turning and turning. Because as someone's belief in you is a powerful thing. You know, you can have all the confidence in the world, but when someone has confidence in you, that definitely, definitely propels you. And that was struggle number two for us. So we went out and we raised some cash, or we tried to raise some cash, and we had two people in the team at the time who also weren't going to get paid. So the struggles we had dealt with started to manifest again a couple of months later. 
We met two people who we thought were incredibly nice, incredibly successful, and were going to help us to take over the world. The reality was they were two vultures, as we call them, trying to come in, take 40% of our business for 100 grand. And 100 grand is a lot of money, no matter who you are. But for where we were with our business, it was an enormous amount of cash. And we struggled with the fact that I was looking, one certain team member who, thank God, is still with us today, asking, you know, do you have my contract for me? to pay me. And I said, yeah, 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 we'll have it you there by the end of the week. Knowing that I had to take on that 100,000 euro to repay his faith because he'd worked for us for free for the previous months. But then also dealing with the fact that in six months time, in 12 months time, these guys are going to have their claws in our business. It was already starting to cause trouble between myself and my co-founder. So we needed to weigh up, you know, do we struggle on, do we do something to try and pay this man's wages and say no to the 100,000? Or do we do the logical thing that everyone thought was what, what seemed like the logical thing and take the 100,000? So we went to term sheets. We had shook on the deal. We agreed we were going in. It came down to the last signature. And I remember Ross and I were sitting in uh, Mahan Point, our offices were down with Mahan Point, in the car park. And we said, this is brilliant. We're about to get 100 grand. And he said, yeah, this is fucking brilliant as well. And then we just put our heads down. And I was like, I don't feel right about this. He goes, neither do I. I said, look, we just can't do this. And we had to ring the two lads who we were supposed to meet within about 24 hours. And we had to ring them straight away and tell them, look, this ain't happening, boys. Sorry, we have to say no. So we had to go back into that office and tell Rob, yeah, Rob, the contract is coming. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get paid. You know, finally your fate has been repaid. But the reality was there was no money there either. Thankfully, we got over that struggle. We got the head down, and we started raising a small bit more cash. And we got to the very, very, very end. The, the wick and the candle, like, it was gone. And we said, look, this is it. Our worst fears, we're not going to make payroll. And that's one thing that we're very proud of, um, that we've never, ever missed payroll. And we said, look, this is it. We're going to miss payroll. We had already agreed for an investor to come in and... Uh, I was walking up past Kildare Street and up Kildare Street and, you know, the dial, uh, the, the whole thing was there. And it was a very surreal experience because, you know, the, the government who claimed to support entrepreneurship and have done for us, but they just weren't there at the time. It was, it, it was very surreal. And we said, look, um, we just got to ring the lads and, or we got to get straight down to Cork and tell them in person, call them in and say, look, there's going to be layoffs or you're not going to be paid. And, you know, things didn't go as planned. Then all of a sudden, and this is a true story, my phone went off and one of our investors who I'm very, very um, of great respect for is uh, a guy who owns Carton House. His name is Connor. Connor texted me and he said, Rich, forgot to tell you, I lodged that investment early. Hope it came true. So we were like, wait a minute. Time had passed. We called into the bank, went over, checked the balance. And uh, Ross and I were almost crying. We were hugging and jumping around. like, And that's we always joke that, you know, uh, People probably thought we were more than just business partners that day, but um, it was a great feeling for us because we had overcome that struggle and we had ensured that we kept the smiley faces and the morale in the office wasn't changed and then we were able to finally reward um, Rob and the rest of the team. So uh, going from that, we ended up raising, we've raised a total of about uh, €750,000. Um, we, we've scaled the team now to there's 14 of us, there's 2.6 million users per month, and it's brilliant. And we decided to take on another challenge after that. And for some reason, it was just that, you know, struggles are necessary. And I believe that anybody who wants to go through life with rainbows and lollipops won't be a happy person after at all. And for us, I think you, you learn the most about yourselves in the most challenging of times. And that's certainly the way it's been for me. Um, so things were going well at Pundit Arena. We were, everything we wanted uh, to do had come true and we were on this trajectory, so we decided to take on another project. And for, so, for some reason, even though we didn't have enough spare time, we took on 1-0. We were sick of going to conferences whereby people turned up in ties and suits and spent the day on their phones, so we decided to create a conference, one that was edgy and one that basically said, we don't care what you think, but we're going to put this on because it's the best content. And we decided to go for the number one divisive person in the world, which I had not realized how divisive he was at the time, and it was Lance Armstrong. And we aligned ourselves as the platform as opposed to the supporters of, of Lance. 
and we put a lot into it, but the reaction was so toxic, and the toxicity related to that man was like a wave that came over us. Anybody that was related to him was immediately the devil also. And it, it was incredible. I, I learned a huge amount from the One Zero conference because the minute we went public, um, I remember I, I released the press release and uh, just my Twitter feed started you know, filling up. And if you go onto Twitter now and search at the boy Barrett and at One Zero Con or, or Lance Armstrong, you'll see some of the stuff that was directed towards. It was crazy. And the struggle for me was that I took on this challenge because I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to progress further and really see if we could make something that people actually wanted to attend and people would remember and people would really, really just, I suppose, feel better about themselves and enjoy it. Whereas the minute we mentioned Lance Armstrong, we immediately, immediately people wanted us to fail. And I had come from the Pundit Arena side where, thanks be to God, we've gotten massive popular PR and everyone's happy for us to do well. And then it was juxtaposed with this kind of, you're evil, we want you to, we want to crush you, we want your business to fail. I had never in my life had to deal with anything like that. And everybody thought we were going to fail. And some people probably still think we failed. But we decided, we decided to bring Mr. Armstrong, Lance, um, uh, on board. We put our faith in him and, you know, we worked so hard, tirelessly, to get this going. And we'd, we had dealt with all the criticism. We had done everything we could. But when you're dealing with a person who is of, of that, I suppose, ilk, then there's always the risk. So we'd finally gotten over that hump whereby people said, oh, we hate you, whereby they were like, look, we're actually interested to come see him. And I got up, I, was, I remember it, and foolishly, I, had, I thought it was done. I was standing, I was over in my house, and stuff was going mental, and there was all things with Kimmage and all sorts with just, you know, past demons had, 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 had arisen. And uh, we finally got over it anyway. And I said, look, Jesus, I went into the RDS, and I looked around, and it's similar to this. We're just looking at the stage, and he said, just that feeling came in that, that's where we're actually going to do this. It, it's going to be the biggest piece of content of the year. Um, Lance Armstrong was walking in arm in arm with Emma O'Reilly, who was the physio. They had now made up. It was going to be a global story. Everything had been sorted. Foolishly, I went back, uh, went to sleep, woke up. It was the day before the conference, and it was about 6 a.m., and uh, I remember I got a text just as I got into my car. And it was an email being forwarded by me, and it said, um, just said to us, really sorry, lads, this looks in jeopardy. Uh, the legal team are pulling it. He said, what? He said, let's go on a call this afternoon. Not saying it's done yet. I remember getting in my car, driving. Uh, I stepped into my car, and I awoke in the RDS. No radio was on, no nothing. I just don't even remember that journey, really. I just remember arriving there. So then we had to speak to the team, and in terms of the struggle in that regard, we were dealing with a member of our team who had put everything, his life and soul, into getting Lance Armstrong to Ireland. And you're dealing with his emotions, tears, the whole lot. Um, I'm standing in the RDS, nobody at all in the RDS, of the 50 to 60 people that were working on building that stage had a clue what was going on. And... It was just like the world was falling down uh, around us and there was nothing we could do. But for me, that struggle, I remember I just took a deep breath and I walked out, looking over, looking the RDS Leinster's pitch, and I just said, the show must go on. And thankfully, we, had no, we, we just had to go with it. We had 36 other speakers, and we went on, and thankfully, people showed their faith in us. People actually bought tickets the minute Lance announced that he wasn't coming. So um, that was that benefit. But those struggles and those difficult periods are what have helped us to grow our business and what have molded us into being able to deflect certain things and not worrying about the minor details, but just getting the job done. And we'll always try to rise to those challenges. For me, struggles are necessary. Struggles should be embraced. So for everyone sitting here, I wish you a world of struggles because it will change your life. Thanks very much for listening.